Hello and welcome back to Electronics with Emrys. In my previous video, we looked at the concepts for building your own 9 volt battery tester kit. And in this video, we're going to be looking at the schematic that I built and the simulations that I ran through KiCad. This is the complete schematic for my 9 volt battery tester kit. Let's look at it in pieces, starting with the power supply. Down here we have the physical battery connection, which I represent as BT1, and then I have these net connectors for power plus on the battery and power minus on the battery. Those don't have any sort of physical representation, they are just electrical connections on the schematic. The first thing the battery connects directly to is the reverse indicator LED, and you can see that's D9 here, with R18 as the limiting resistor. That diode only turns on if the battery is hooked up backwards. However, this LED cannot support 9 volts directly across it, so whenever it's connected the correct way, the battery is turning on D10, and that provides a small voltage drop through R18 as the limiting resistor again. I'm not going to explain exactly how this MOSFET protects the circuit because that's in the concepts video, but Q2 is the transistor that's going to prevent the reverse battery from damaging anything else in the circuit. You can see that the ground connection does not go directly to the battery negative, it goes to this MOSFET first, which is what's going to provide the protection. The positive battery terminal goes to one more place, which is the input for our LDO regulator, the LP2950. This regulator needs an input capacitor and an output capacitor for stability. And the output's going to be our regulated 5 volts that's going to be used throughout the rest of the circuit. The last piece of this portion of the schematic is going to be the voltage divider that steps the battery voltage down to the range that our comparators can measure. So we have a 220K and a 100K. That's going to bring our 9 volt battery down to 3 volts. And finally, C5 is the capacitor that slows down the lighting of the LEDs, producing a little bit of an animation whenever you test a battery. Here, instead of using one of the power ports, I used a net label, VMES, for my measurement voltage. Now let's look over the comparator circuit. Over on the far left, you can see the resistor ladder that goes from 5 volts all the way down to 0 volts, and this is producing all of the different references for the comparator to measure against. Even though there are connections coming off the side of each of these resistors, those don't really do much because there's very little current going into the input of a comparator. So that means I'll end up with very accurate voltages at each of these nodes based on the calculations I did last time, as long as my 5 volt regulator is working correctly. Each LM339 has four channels of comparator and I have them split up with U1 being these four and U2 being these four. Each of those chips also has a power connection that's shown up here as segment E, and you can see the comparator is powered off of the regulated 5 volts. I also add this capacitor as a bypass capacitor for that chip. Then, as we mentioned last time, each of these has an open drain output, so that means it can only drive in the low state. And we're going to be connecting our LED and limiting resistor to the positive supply on the output. Putting everything horizontally like this just made it a lot easier to fit it all in one page for me. In this case, I labeled my nets to show that I have 95% output here, 90%, 75%, and so on. And I added some comments into the schematic that indicate the color of those LEDs for my reference. And that's it. The schematic is actually pretty simple for this device. Let's take a look at the simulation that I ran through KiCad. I decided to leave the LDO out of my simulation because I trust that it's going to work the way I expect, and instead I'm just going to replace it with a voltage source. This is something very common, at least for me, in simulations because I don't want to test out an entire system at a very low level because that would be a very slow simulation and often will cause you issues and crash. It's better to test out those individual pieces separately. So if you're not sure if your LDO is going to be stable, it's better to simulate that separately uh, using transients and a good model for it. And then you can 
bring that over to your final simulation as a simplified version like this. I kept my simulation components separated over to the side here because I was going to delete them before I actually created my board. Next up, I needed to add a voltage source that's going to represent the battery connecting to the board. I like to use piecewise linear functions for this type of thing because they allow me a lot of control in exactly how the voltage is going to be applied. If you're not familiar with a piecewise linear function, it's really simple. The first value is time and the second value is the voltage that you're going to be outputting. So in this case, at zero time, I'm starting at 9.7 volts. And then at 100 seconds, I'm going to be outputting 5 volts. So that has my voltage ramped down in 100 seconds from 9.7 to 5. For the LM339 model, I used a single channel model and then I combined that into a quad channel library file. I show how to do this in my SPICE simulation for KiCad video, which I'll link. You can see that I have an error here whenever I try to run my simulation the first time, and that's because I didn't include any models for my diodes. I considered just excluding all of the LEDs from the simulation to make my life a little bit easier, but I ended up deciding to give each one a diode model. Something I hope that they get in the future is the ability to add diode models to many devices at the same time because sometimes you want to have a whole bunch of devices with the same model. And, uh, you know, I could go in and delete all my diodes and, you know, copy one that has a model already on it. I have to redo it that way. But in this case, I ended up just uh, placing it onto each one individually. I actually made a mistake in my quad circuit. Whenever you take a look here, you can see that I forgot to put the sub-circuit name after each one of those sub-circuit calls, and that showed up whenever I tried to run the simulation, so I was able to quickly fix that. I also made a mistake with my transient spice call there. I'm used to a different simulator. Updating the transient command, I just put in the time step and the final time, and now the simulation runs no problem. There you can see that the voltage drops from 9.7 down to 5, like I programmed it to. And you can use the probe schematic tool to be able to look at individual signals. Here I'm looking at the output of the first comparator, and we can see that it appears to be extremely unstable at the output. In the real world, I highly doubt that this is what would really happen. This is probably just an artifact of the simulator, most likely related to the time step that I used. Looking at the step-down measurement voltage, we can see that that is stepped down to 3 volts like we expect at the beginning, and it ramps down linearly with the other voltage there. Looking at the reference voltage, we can see that the comparator is triggering at exactly the level we think it should. Picking up a couple more comparators, we can see that they trigger at later levels. So the first one triggered at around 14 seconds, and the next one was at 40 seconds, and then at 72 seconds. So those aren't exact percentages because of the way the battery discharges in real life. It's not a linear discharge, but they do show that the comparators are triggering the way I expect as the battery discharges. In order to try to fix that ringing that we're seeing, I changed the time step in my simulation, and you can see that that changed things a lot. So it is very likely to be an issue with the simulator itself and not with my circuit. Having a huge amount of overshoot like that on an open drain output is extremely unlikely. Open drain outputs just can't drive the high state very strongly. They're, they're driven by an external circuit. In this case, it's a 330 ohm resistor, which is really not going to provide that much current. I mean, if the output had one ohm and we were driving into a light load, a light capacitive load, then we'd expect to see huge ringing like that, having the, the input shoot way above the uh, supply voltage, but that's not what's really going to happen in the circuit. The LEDs are going to turn on and they're going to clamp that voltage very quickly. So we're not going to see that in the real world. Not a real concern. I think it's really important to be able to differentiate as a circuit designer between a real problem that your simulation is showing you and a problem that the simulator is probably exaggerating or uh, maybe outright lying to you about because of an issue with the way it's simulating. And some of that is just going to come from experience. 
Uh, some of that you can tinker around with settings and see changes like I did here. Uh, that'll show you that the simulator is uh, not quite right. And here's where I actually added in my net labels for those outputs. And that's primarily because I wanted to be able to easily look at them in the simulator. Now rerunning my simulation, I'm able to pick out the specific voltages that I want to see, which are the outputs of the comparators and the measured voltages. So there we can see the 2%, 5%, 10%, all the way up to 95% different discharge levels. Zooming in a little bit, we can see that uh, there's a whole bunch of ringing and those are individual steps. You can see that it's, you can see that the individual data points there are separated out. So one is very high up, the next is very far down. Um, and that's usually an indicator to me that there's a problem with the simulation step size and not the actual circuit. If we make tighter step sizes, then the simulator would be able to more accurately represent the curve on the output of that comparator. But realistically, for something that's on a human scale time like this, doing 100 seconds, if I were to drop that to a nanosecond, we'd be waiting all day and maybe all century for my simulation to finish, which uh, I'm not willing to do just for that level of accuracy. And here I've dropped a cursor onto my voltage there so that I can observe exactly what voltage we've got, making sure that everything's triggering at the levels I expect them to, which obviously they do. We get all the way down to 5.92 volts at the end there, and that's where the battery is basically dead, right at 6 volts, the 2% that we've previously discussed. So it looks like my comparator is working exactly the way I expect it to. The simulation is very successful in showing me that my resistor ladder produces all the voltages that I want it to, the comparator is triggering at all those appropriate levels and there's nothing unexpected going on in my circuit with the exception of those minor artifacts that we're seeing from the simulation and those are nothing to worry about. The only other thing I probably could have simulated here would be the reverse connection of the battery to verify that my MOSFET is going to turn off everything the way it's supposed to. But I actually double checked that using a separate simulator, which I did not record, so I apologize for not having that in here. But realistically, uh, that's a circuit I've used numerous times, and I just triple checked it by throwing it into QSpice and observing that everything worked the way I thought it should. It took one minute of my time to do that. The only thing I was a little worried about was that the MOSFET would produce too much resistance, and we would end up throwing off our measurement voltages in the final circuit. But you can see that from our simulation here, everything worked pretty darn close to what I wanted. And uh, it's definitely good enough for building the circuit in the real world and uh, getting a prototype done. So the next thing we're going to be doing in the next video is the actual board design. We'll build up the layout and then we'll be done with this project. So I hope if you're building one of these yourself, you have some good ideas of exactly how you can put together your schematic in KiCad. If you have any specific questions or any roadblocks you run into, feel free to post them on my video. I will be happy to answer. You can also reach out to me at electronicswithemrys at gmail.com. And if you've made it this far in the video, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day.